Good afternoon. My name is Jan O'Neill and I'm a community coach with the County Health Rankings and Roadmaps program and I'm joined by my colleague Mary Bennett. Hello everyone. I'm really happy to be part of this webinar today and I'll be answering questions and chatting out links. Thanks, Mary, and we're excited to have Edwin Argueta and Natalia Bertet Garcia with us today to talk with us about how they are working in Everett, Massachusetts to mobilize residents and community partners to address issues of racial justice, immigration, and assimilation. Hi, Edwin and Natalia, are you there? Yes, we are. Uh, Hello. Nice to be here with you. Great. Hi, thank, thank you for having us. Great, thanks for joining us. And I did just want to mention that Everett, Massachusetts was a, a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Culture of Health Prize winner in 2015. And we featured them in our community engagement webinar in April. Edwin is now back with us, joined by Natalia, to take us deeper into their work as community organizers. So as we begin this webinar, we'd like to acknowledge the important relationship we have with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Based at the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute, the County Health Rankings and Roadmaps Program is a collaboration with RWJF. And before we get into the webinar content, we want to take a moment to get you oriented to the technology we're using today. The GoToWebinar in attendee interface is made up of two parts. On the left, you can see the viewer window where you'll see our screen throughout the presentation. And on the right, you can see the control panel. And you can also interact with us excuse me, throughout the, through the control panel by using the question section. Please feel free to ask questions or share your thoughts and experiences with us via the control panel throughout our webinar today, and we'll be sure to leave time for your questions. Here's a look at what we're going to talk about today. We'll start with a brief overview of the County Health Rankings and Roadmaps program to help set the stage for our topic. We'll also highlight a key activity, some stories, and a community organizing toolkit from our Action Center. We'll then talk with Edwin and Natalia about their work in Everett, and we'll be sure to take time for your questions to help you put this information to use in your community. We'll close with ways to stay up to date with County Health Rankings and Roadmaps development, developments and updates. And then at the top of the hour, we'll wrap up, but for those of you who would like to continue some question and answer with our guests, we'll keep the platform open for an additional 15 minutes or so. So this question guides our webinar today. We'd love to hear your examples. Please use the question box to share with us what's worked well in your community. And our question, how can we support communities in mobilizing for changes that will improve health for all? If you have some examples of that in your community, please chat with us and be sure to include the name of your community so that we can share this with others on the webinar. Feel free to share your examples as we go through these next slides. We'd like you to consider these questions as you listen uh, during the webinar. Who else do you need to share this information with? And what's one idea for action that you're taking away? What else do you need to know to take action and use this information? So we'll start with a brief program overview to ground our discussion in the County Health Rankings and Roadmaps, and this will take about five minutes. If you're newer to us, it'll give you a high-level overview of County Health Rankings and Roadmaps. And to learn more, we encourage you to check out one of our Rankings and Roadmaps 101 webinars. Mary will chat out a link to our most recent recording. So looking at this image, the County Health Rankings ranks the health of nearly every county in every state. For every, each county, you'll find two rankings, uh, one for health outcomes and one for health factors. This image shows the relationship between policy, health factors, and health outcomes. It illustrates why it's important for communities to take a broad definition of health. Many factors impact how well and how long we live. So things like how we commute to work, housing conditions, access to parks, the quality of our schools, access to healthy foods, community safety, and uh, our social connectedness all impact our health outcomes. 
Starting from the bottom, we know that effective policies and programs can improve a variety of factors that in turn shape the health of communities. There are many health factors that shape our community's health outcomes. We specifically look at health behaviors, clinical care, social and economic factors, and the physical environment. And we measure two types of health outcomes to show how healthy each county is, length of life and quality of life. Now this is really challenging work and we know that communities sometimes want or need support to figure out first or next steps. And with that in mind, let's take a look at the Roadmaps to Health Action Center. The Take Action Cycle is the how within rankings and roadmaps. It lays out the process communities can follow to improve their health. The Action Center includes guidance and tools to help communities keep moving along this cycle. And Mary will be sharing links to some relevant tools in these guides during today's webinar. These links will, will also be posted with the webinar recording online later this week. Since we're focusing on community organizing today, we'll take you to some guidance you'll find for this work in the Act on What's Important guide. When you click on Act on What's Important, you're led to this, this page, and it'll explain it's the purpose of the step and who to involve and so forth. You'll also find nine key activities, one of which is organizing and mobilizing your community. We'd like to highlight a couple of stories you'll find when you go to this key activity. You can learn how in Baltimore a multi-sector community campaign led by grassroots organizers convinced the Maryland legislature to pass an unprecedented $1.1 billion financing plan to rebuild and renovate Baltimore schools. And in rural Burnett County in Wisconsin, where there's high poverty and no public transportation, you can read how a group of concerned citizens achieved some quick wins while working on a longer-term transportation plan. And you'll also see a community organizing tool in this activity called People Power from the Grassroots. And Mary's going to put this link in the chat for you right now. In fact, the links to all of these stories. As we mentioned at the beginning, Everett, Massachusetts was an RWJF Culture of Health Prize winner in 2015. Here you'll see the six criteria that Everett had to demonstrate to be awarded this competitive prize. While you'll hear all these criteria play out during our interview with our guests for the purposes of our webinar today, we invite you to listen particularly to their commitment to equal opportunity for health and how they're harnessing collective power to achieve that. You can view Everett's story and learn more about past prize winners on our site. And again, Mary will be chatting out that web address to you now. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Edwin and Natalia into our conversation. Edwin is a Salvadoran immigrant and is one of the immigrant workers' rights organizers for Massachusetts Jobs with Justice, and he has primary responsibility for immigrant rights and workers' rights work. Edwin is president of the board of La Comunidad, Inc., and he's been active for many years in the immigrant rights movement and organized labor as a service provider, advocate, and organizer. And Natalia is an organizer with Massachusetts Jobs with Justice. She's been at the organization for two years, and she's passionate about making the connections between workers' rights and immigrants' rights. So welcome again, Edwin and Natalia. Thank you. Thank you. So Edwin, can you set the stage a bit for us? Tell us a little bit about Everett, Massachusetts demographic changes, because this is a big part of your story. Most definitely. Uh, well, again, uh, thanks uh, uh, for the invitation, and I'm happy to be here, um, and and hopefully uh, we'll give you an idea of our of what our community looks like, and what some of the challenges are, and how are we trying to address those, and uh, hopefully there's something that we can teach to folks who are part of the audience. Um, I'd like to start just by saying that you know Everett is just like many communities. Um, you know, across the United States, um, perhaps uh, some of you, you know, come from one of those communities. Um, Everett is one of the many gateway cities in Massachusetts that has experienced a dramatic demographic change in the last uh, two decades. 
It is located just outside of Boston on the Mystic and Malden Rivers. We have about 42,000 people who live in pretty much 3.4 square miles. Two square miles of residential land and the rest is occupied by light and heavy industry. Everett has the third highest number of people in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts who have been born outside the U.S. and residents here speak about 45 different languages. The median household income right now uh, in Everett is about $48,000 versus you know the statewide average which is about $66,000. 60% of housing is rendered occupied compared to 36% statewide. But for the purposes of, the, of, of our conversation, you know, we want to take a look especially at this figure. According to recent census information, there are approximately about 10,000 jobs available in, inside of our city. But yet, almost 20,000 of those residents have to travel outside the city to go to work. And only or roughly about 600 residents to stay in the city to go to work. That's what our city looks like right now. Thank you, Edwin. And um, on our community engagement webinar, when you were a guest with other folks who were part of the Everett Community Health Partnership, you all talked about how the One Everett organization is focusing on these three priority areas, housing availability and affordability, economic stability, and opportunities for children, families, and youth. As one of the partners in One Everett, could you place your work in context of these priorities? Why does organizing need to go hand in hand with policy and services, making sure that Everett is a healthy community? Sure. Um, we often talk about how you know, people are the most important asset that we have in our communities. Uh, yes, we may have great, um, you know, elected leaders. Yes, we may have great organizations, you know, that are providing services. Yes, we may have great advocates that are, um, you know, asking the right questions when it comes to, you know, uh, addressing some of the challenges that we face. Um, and, you know, through our work and through our experience, we realize that, you know, one thing cannot go without the other. You know, the left hand has to talk to the right hand. Um, so. Although there are different kinds of organizing, like youth organizing, housing justice organizing, immigrant rights organizing, and et cetera, our focus or the focus of our, of our work and, uh, and how we look at this is, is through the lens of workers' rights as the primary identity for the community organizing we do. The question we always ask ourselves is, what is the intersection of workers' rights to the other many issues the workers are affected by on a daily basis. And here's our connection to, you know, the, the One Everett Coalition. Um, by supporting our, our members, both La Comunidad Inc. and the Everett Haitian Community Center, organizations that have been providing services um, to both Latinos and Haitians, which make up a big chunk of this dramatic change in the last 20 years, um, you know, we want to make sure that immigrants are not only accepted but are also fully participate in the fabric of, of our city so that no more issues around discrimination, you know, um, you know, uh, lack of uh, employment, et cetera, you know, happens. Um, we also, you know, think about how do we make sure our public schools are adequately funded so they provide a good quality education for all our kids. How do we make sure that banks and other corporations do not push residents out of their homes and do not disrupt their lives and health. And as workers face issues at their workplace, you know, we know that they're also confronted with many of these other things. They are happening simultaneously. So throughout One Everett, you know, we make sure that we also fight to ensure that Everett residents access and inclusion, you know, aspects of civic life, particularly around housing affordability, public education, civic participation, and immigrant rights are actually addressed. We always need to make sure that service provision and policy making go hand in hand, like I said before, with community organizing in order to effectively meet the challenges 
uh, worker space. Um, and, you know, again, just want to circle back at this is what makes a community a healthy community. You can't try to solve, you know, one issue in your little corner or work in silos. We all have to try to work together to make sure that we're elevating everybody, you know, and improving the quality of life for everybody who lives in the city. Thank you, Edwin. That's great. So, um, Natalia, maybe you can talk with us a little bit about the principles you use in community organizing. Sure. And again, thank you for uh, having us. This is really exciting. So as change agents and as people who are doing this work, um, as we do this work, we need principles to guide us and to ground ourselves in, right? Those are very important. Um, so I wanted to start us off by saying that the first, well, addressing the first one, which is that organizing is a dynamic process. Um, change will not happen overnight. I often think back to a few years back before I was even organizing or even knew what organizing was. I was working at a factory and myself and a lot of the other undocumented workers at the factory were not getting paid on time and often we would go weeks without a paycheck and our wages would be missing. Sometimes we wouldn't get paid our overtime. I didn't know what organizing was but I knew this was not fair. So I was trying to rally people together and I, I kept telling the workers, they can't do this without us. If we all stand up and say, until you pay us, we will walk off the job and you can't run this place without us. And I wasn't understanding and I was getting very frustrated when I wasn't getting quick responses. But it takes time and relationship building in order to do this work and in order for it to work the right way, right? Uh, it cannot be rushed because of uh, timelines or deadlines. Um, Usually you'll see those uh, deadlines or timelines for policy making imposed by people or institutions that hold a lot of political power or economic power, but we really believe in building that trust and that solidarity through one-to-one -one relationships in this work. It's incredibly important to remember that that takes time. Secondly, you want to meet people where they're at. Um, People are motivated by their self-interest. Uh, we at Jobs with Justice use a popular education methodology. We don't believe that we as organizers hold all the answers. Uh, we want to pull from the knowledge in the room collectively. We speak to people in everyday language and not necessarily with sophisticated terminology, and by that I mean jargon. <laughs> a lot of times we'll hear acronyms or theory thrown around, and that's not always relatable to folks, right? Um, we don't claim to have all the answers, and we understand that, again, knowledge is built collectively through the people and through conversations, um, primarily the people you're organizing with. They are the greatest asset that you have in this work, so we want to make sure to always be cultivating leadership of uh, folks we're organizing with and working with. Building multi-sector coalitions uh, is incredibly important. As we heard earlier, um, you know, housing availability and affordability, opportunities for youth, um, immigration status, all of these things impact one's physical and mental health outcomes, right? And so we want to remember that we're not one issue people, right? Um, so it makes sense to address all of the different identities that we hold and all of the issues our communities may face because of that. And in order to do that, we have to build multi-sector coalitions, meaning healthcare providers, ESL teachers, immigrant rights activists, um, you know, politicians, city officials. We cannot effectively address these issues by ourselves and we have to work together and uh, make those connections and see that overlap in, in the identities that um, are held in, in the communities we're working with, right? Embracing multilingual justice. Um, in our city, there are a lot of residents whose English, who, who do not speak English as a first language. Um, we want to make sure that we create opportunities for people to fully participate um, using their native language. So it helps when flyers are translated into different languages, uh, the languages that reflect the communities that we're in. But if you have just a flyer and you don't actually have an interpreter there um, at a meeting, people cannot fully access the space. Um, they'll feel like their voice is not being heard, um, and usually what will end up happening is the conversation will be dominated in English and there won't be space made for folks who don't speak English as a first language. Um, at Jobs with Justice, we really embrace and center multilingual justice. We make sure that our flyers, our materials are translated and that we include interpretation as part of the process and planning. It is not an afterthought, it is a, it is a core 
item on the checklist when we're planning an event or a gathering. Understanding context. Um, understanding the context around the organizing you're doing, uh, which means taking the time to do power mapping in a community, being strategic when you're organizing, uh, when you organize, meaning assess what's a winnable campaign, how the campaign is going to happen, who's the right target, what do you want the target to deliver. This is incredibly important. The last point, successful organizing is frequently qualitative. I can't stress this enough. While reports with numbers and statistics hugely important tools and we need them to be able to measure our progress, um, what we will find is that it's it's really about the quality of the relationships we're building. And again, to go back to our first few points, those take time and trust building. And, and that's how we build solidarity and that's how we win. This is great, Natalia. I think you've just given us community organizing 101, which I know you all do in great depth. And, and uh, you actually have a training tool that um, builds capacity for community organizing. If you could explain the tool and, and then uh, one of you give us an example to think through a winnable campaign, that would be great. Sure. I'll just uh, very quickly go over. This is a Jobs with Justice triangle of values. Uh, just to preface this, we have an entire training on this, uh, but the idea behind, we're, we're going to go a little bit into it, but not too deep. Um, the idea is this, that we essentially are organizing around our values. Um, you know, you have, organizing is as old as humans have been around. There's been years of work done by organizers and organizations, and um, because of that, we, we know that there's been a lot of good and a lot of wins, right? Um, Essentially, people build power by organizing and taking action around their values. So as you see with the values triangle, it's built on um, relationship building, self-interest, why should people take an interest in, in joining your cause, organizing, and power. And that's not just power, um, meaning the target and who holds the power to actually make the change, but people power, because we actually hold the ability to make that change. Um, and we always center our organizing around our values, and that is what we use to agitate people to get involved. Thank you. I know you've got a whole training behind that. So again, thanks for the quick thumbnail on that. There's a lot more. And we've actually got this as a handout that will be posted with this uh, recording on our site later this week. So great. Um, so, Edwin, can you talk a little bit about the application of this um, triangle model to, to a campaign that you're actually working on right now? Um, sure. Um, so, uh, I, I want to stress one of the things that Natalia uh, was talking about, it, and, and that is, you know, how do we use, you know, a tool like the triangle value to determine, you know, what's the best course of action? So in the case of, you know, of our city in Everett, um, we are now faced with the challenge of having, the challenge and the opportunity, I should say, of uh, having um, a developer building a casino resort in our little city, um, which will impact greatly all aspects of life. So, but to give you a little bit of a perspective, in June of 2013, by a vote of 500, you know, uh, 5,220 votes to 833, a small portion of the total every population approve a referendum to establish a casino, a casino resort in our city. You know, many people, including, you know, the developer and some city elected officials, you know, actually promoted, you know, the vote as a big and gigantic win. You know, this was a landslide. But yeah, many organizations, churches, and, and, and organizations and their members, including La Comunidad and the in one Everett, you know, we had a lot of questions and a lot of reservations about the project, uh, but we couldn't figure it out. Well, how are we going to, you know, address this, right? So we started thinking, you know, of some questions that are important. Um, you know, will, will we Everett residents actually be able to work on the project, and how do how do we make sure that happens? Uh, will there be an increase of crime in our city? You know, and how we are going to address, you know, prostitution, drugs, and gambling addiction. Uh, will there be a significant increase of traffic activity in our main roads and throughout the city, et cetera, et cetera? Will the project itself create a squeeze on the housing market, drive, you know, the the prices of homes, and therefore price people out out of the city? So clearly, uh, we 
are not were not in a position to answer you know all those things at once and there were multiple groups of people you know talking about you know pieces of those uh, questions and what we decided is that you know we need to go back to our members we need to ask them you know what their thoughts are and also together assess whether or not we have the capacity to fight against a well resourced project and predictably our members were split. Some of them said, yes, this is good for the city. Some of others, you know, said, no, you know, it's going to bring a lot of bad things to our city. Um, and it became clear that we as an organization, whenever, you know, we didn't have the resources to stop the project. You know, at that point, the vote had been taken. The Gaming Commission basically was on the path to giving, giving the, the license, the gaming license to the developer. And we felt like, well, we need to do something. So, you know, through a series of conversations with members and other folks in the city, you know, we focus on something that we all agreed on. And this is very important. We all agreed that one of the things that we could do out of this is to make sure that every residents actually have access to good paying jobs for both phases of the project, the construction phase and the permanent phase of the, of the project. But particularly for our, our members, immigrants and people of color that have now made ever their home and make a big chunk of the population in the, in the city. So we devised a plan to engage all the stakeholders that have something to say, that they have the ability to decide, to make decisions about the project. You know, all the way from the, develop, the casino developer himself, uh, the gaming commission, the city of Everett, uh, to our members. Um, so, and in the last two years, and I'll summarize, you know, what we have been uh, working on in the last two years. So, in the last two years, we have been making inroads, and you know, to the point where at this time, we have been able to secure a spot in the what's called the Gaming Commission's Access and Opportunity Committee, where we have a push for an, a percentage increase of women and minorities that should be higher for both the construction and the permanent phases of the project. I think we you know, have asked for 41%. I think we got it in the language of the, um, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the project uh, development. Um, we actually have now, we met recently with the mayor of the city uh, and presented up to create a constituency-based pre-apprenticeship -pre program that would create a pool of workers from our community that are ready to enter the casino project for both the construction and the permanent uh, phases. Uh, meaning that, you know, a lot of our folks need a little bit of help with, you know, doing their resumes. A lot of, of our folks need help with actually filling the applications for employment with the, with the trade unions that are going to be participating in the project. Uh, some of our folks need help with, you know, orientation about how to navigate the application process from the developer himself, and, and so on and so forth. So we actually have a meeting uh, next Thursday with the mayor, and we'll hear if he will actually fund and agree to have the constituency-based uh, uh, pre-apprenticeship program housed at both organizations, La Comunidad and Every Haitian Community Center are as part of one Everett to deliver the services for the project and make sure that residents from Everett have gained access to those jobs. So, um, you know, that's one way for us to think about how to, you know, um, address a challenge and take it and, and, and turn it into an opportunity and engage all the folks who are working on, you know, the substance abuse problem, the, the, the traffic, uh, um, uh, you know, increase in the city, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we think that all those things together are going to make, you know, uh, the quality of life, even with the casino, you know, now in the city, uh, uh, you know, better, you know, because we'll have access to better jobs and we'll be talking to each other about how to address, you know, these other things. Thank you so much, Edwin. What I love about what your your story illustrates, I've heard it called a, a problemunity. Um, it's a problem and an opportunity at the same time, yeah. right? And and how you really were very um, targeted, and you looked at what could be one. You looked at where the core values were that you could share with others. Certainly, with the mayor, who's part of one uh, Everett. Um, where where do we have things in common, and where can we uh, coalesce to help the people of our city? Um, I think that's a great example of of what 
the, the tool uh, showed as an image. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. Um, before we open it up to Q&A, I know, Natalia, you wanted to talk a little bit about uh, just briefly what community organizing is not <laughs> so that um, folks can uh, really hear also what it is. So if you could briefly take us through these points. Sure. So a lot of... Um, so, okay, yes, let's start with the endless meetings with no action. Community, community organizing is not attending endless meetings with no action. A lot of times when um, we keep having these planning meetings, um, you tend to lose folks quickly. So they're very important to have planning meetings, but you want to make sure that there's always, we call it homework, <laughs> something for folks to take out of the room and action steps for them to take with them. And that keeps people plugged in, engaged, and energized. Um, tactics without strategy and strategy without goals. It's really great to get petitions signed, to have rallies, to have meetings with officials. Those are tactics, though, and if your tactics are not plugging into a broader plan or strategy with an end goal, um, things can get really confusing and, and there's no clear kind of outcome, right? And it, it's not going to seem, it's not going to be as winnable. Um, taking on issues affecting poor and working people without consulting with them. So this goes kind of back to what we said about cultivating leadership. Um, you want to make sure that impacted people are leading um, their causes and speaking for themselves. We do not uh, exist to speak for people. We want to cultivate enough leadership and, and really empower folks to get up and tell their stories um, and really be the driving force behind campaigns and, and actions. Expecting you can win an issue without having credible relations with labor, clergy, and community. It's really important, as we said earlier, to um, establish a table with all of these different groups in the community, um, official, community members, officials, labor leaders, um, clergy, and that's because people listen to different people in their community, right? Um, so something might resonate better with somebody if it's their pastor who's saying it, or if it's their, um, you know, field rep in their union who's who's pulling them in and saying, hey, attend this meeting with me. So it's really important um, to establish those really credible relationships in order to pull people in from all sectors. So the same people being in leadership positions, again, we always want to be cultivating, cultivating leadership um, and having new faces and people who are actually impacted at the head of these causes. Um, failing to train activists in skills of empowerment. We don't want to do things for people, right? I always um, tell people the goal is to organize myself out of a job. I want, I want to be able to skill share and really develop um, a skill set in, in folks so that they can take this back into their community and develop more leaders and we'll have leaders for generations to come. Community organizing is not organizing other organizers. Um, you want to really make sure if you have an action, a rally, an event, that your table doesn't look like all you know, staff or organizers. You, again, really want the community there, and that means we're going to have to put in the work to do that, right? So that means flyering in neighborhoods, doing some door knocking, making those calls, and really making sure that the community members are there. And also making sure those spaces are accessible to community by making sure that your meetings are not, you know, at times where only paid staff who are paid to do this work could get there, right? So we try to make sure as much as possible that our meetings and events are accessible to working folks and families. Um, I also, I, I just want to underscore, I, I really, it really hit me when you talked about organizing other organizers. You always bring other people with you, so just kind of underlining that rather than, um, so building out the movement, yeah. So thank you so much. Uh, either one of you, Edwin or Natalia, anything you'd like to add before we open up to questions or any key, key takeaways you want folks to have before we open it up? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, one of the things that we often talk about when we uh, do community organizing is that we want to create the multiplayer effect, you know, uh, uh, make the connections between even generations, right? You know, I, I have benefited from a long history of, you know, uh, social justice organizing from folks who have done it for a long time in my community, the Salvadoran community in the U.S. and even back home. Um, so that's one thing. The other is, you know, you always look for the missing pieces, you know, what's missing. I remember at a meeting with the mayor uh, of our city, uh, uh, Carlo de Maria, you know, he did say, oh, this is the missing piece for what's going on around the casino, you know, some kind of workforce development program that we don't have, that you now, you know, 
uh, are, are presenting it to me. And that was really exciting because you know we you know we went into a meeting without knowing is he going to like this idea is he not going to like this idea there's always a missing piece you know that that you kind of want to uh, hopefully think about and the last is that you know you organize you know there's always a, a, a place for everybody in the movement you know not everybody's going to be you know on the phone calling people there's you know you know uh, there there's space for folks who who don't like you know public speaking. But they're great at door knocking. Uh, there are folks who are really good, um, you know, uh, presenters of you know policy ideas. There are others that are really good at translating, you know, very wonky terminology to you know the average person that is walking down the street and not thinking about you know very complicated language uh, around policy. So you know, those are some things to think about um, as we build out a movement that tries to lift up everybody at the same time. Thank you, Edwin. Are you both ready for questions, or would you like to add something, Natalia, before we go on? No, I'm, I'm ready for questions. You're ready. OK, great. Well, we have a, a number of really good ones. <laughs> so I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Mary. And Mary, how, what, what's our first question there? Thank you so much for doing such a wonderful overview of community organizing. And we uh, did, we have been getting lots of questions. And uh, as many people in our audience are from rural areas, one question that has come up several times is, do you have examples of this? I know you're in an urban area, but do you feel like these same principles apply to rural areas? or um, do you know of differences in terms of organizing in rural areas as opposed to urban areas? Um, I, I mean, I think, I think the principles are universal. I mean, uh, some of these principles I have actually, you know, uh, studying uh, how organizing happened back in my country, you know, with peasants, with um, you know, students and with women who then later created cooperatives, uh, you know, uh, are, are essentially the same, are pretty universal. I mean, I think you always have to be mindful, well, who is the audience? Who are the people that you're organizing with? Uh, I, we can't come in, you know, the rule, the, the, the golden rule for us is not to come in, you know, with, you know, this uh, pretense that we're experts, that we know everything. No. Collective knowledge, just like Natalia was talking about, you know, comes from from you know the folks that you're organizing with, uh, they understand you know the environment, they understand the culture, they understand their surroundings, they understand the issues, and we're you know sort of you know conveners, we're sort of facilitators of a process. Organizing is a process that brings everybody together, and I feel like you know these are some universal principles that could be applied. Uh, uh, understanding you know and recognizing that whatever works here in Little Everett, Little Boston, or or a state of Massachusetts is not applicable, you know, uh, it's not necessarily the same uh, for other parts of the country, but some of the basics, I think they're quite applicable. And, um, you know, one of the things that has been helpful to us and, and, and me personally as an organizer to completely understand this concept of the popular education methodology, you know, which brings us, you know, uh, uh, to meet people where they're at. Okay, um, let's see, there's another question um, that came up and it has to do with um, how to effectively advocate for higher wages uh, without potentially alienating donors by becoming political. Have you run into that in your, you know, as you're working with folks in One Everett? Um, how, how do they address that? I think this is a core question for many of our folks in the audience. Um, we haven't necessarily come up with, you know, uh, a, a brick wall or resistance. Um, quite to the contrary, I think, um, and, and thankfully to a much larger movement out there that is actually raising this question, you know, why is it that, you know, we have so low wages in certain sectors of our, you know, industries, right? Uh, I think there is an understanding that there is a big, um, disparity between uh, people that have a lot, a lot of money, and the rest of the, the, the of the population who are who are uh, workers. 
Um, so I, I, I think, you know, in, in a project, I think what's, 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 what's universal is, is just this, the, 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 the amount or human, humongous, how humongous, you know, the casino project is. It's a project that is worth about $2 billion. Um, and, you know, this is going to be located in a community that has about 40,000 uh, residents. So, you know, everybody clearly understands there's plenty, you know, to go around. Now, if you add that to what's happening in the metropolitan area of Boston, Boston is going through a, another a, a big uh, construction boom, I mean, to the tune of, you know, another $10 billion. So if you add the, the construction, you know, that is happening in the city, in, in, in the metropolitan area of Boston, and every you're looking at at least $12 billion worth of work for the next five, ten years. So everybody pretty much agrees, except, you know, a few uh, people, uh, but everybody else pretty much agrees that, you know, there's something to be said about, you know, raising the workers' wages in relation to what is the cost of living in, in, the, in, in our city, area, in our metropolitan area, but also our state. You know, the cost of living just keeps going up and up, and we need to catch up, you know, with that. The question is about messaging, and uh, there are several of them, but it comes down to really what is important to think about in terms of messaging, and also what's to avoid in terms of uh, getting the issue out there and getting the impact and results that you want. Sure. I think um, with messaging, for me as an organizer, it is always incredibly important to uplift personal stories um, in any campaign that we do. I think oftentimes um, to shift narrative, we really have to personalize stories. If we're talking about wage issues, housing issues, um, it's really easy to kind of let the other side um, kind of run with this narrative of, of um, this kind of corporate narrative, right? And so when you hear from the actual people who are impacted by these issues and people hear personal stories, um, that really can shift and change hearts and, and minds, right? So for me, whenever I'm working on any campaign, I let the messaging be guided by the personal experiences of the people that I'm organizing with in the community. That is just so excellent. Thank you very much. Um, one, uh, uh, participant has asked, what are some, and I think you've spoken about this, but um, what are some first steps we can take to advance economic justice, and are there any best practices related to economic justice? And I think it's a lot, again, what you've been talking about, but um, could you just share some additional thoughts on that, please? Sure. Um, for me, in terms of getting started uh, organizing towards economic justice, I would say um, convene an initial meeting right, with key leaders uh, and folks in your community um, who are already involved. I think it's really important. Sometimes we want to recreate the wheel, but you'll find often in, in your communities that there are already people sometimes doing this work, and if not, um, getting, getting an original uh, kind of a first meeting of people together to Uh, yes? Uh, I, we can't quite hear you right now, Natalia. You dropped off. Hello? Are we having technical difficulties? Pardon us, audience. Um, Edwin, could you chime in, please? Sure. So when we talk about economic justice, I think uh, we often, in our work, we talk about it from both places, right? From uh, the people that are affected by economic uh, injustices, but also, yeah. you know, by who's doing the injustices. And, and, and again, I want to reiterate that, you know, there's many kinds of organizing in our lenses, workers' rights, and understanding the economic system that we're in. Um, but, you know, once you have an understanding, you know, of that picture, 
then you have to dive into the context, you know, like what is it that, that we're talking about? What is it that I would try to address? Because sometimes you feel like you're creating a solution for a particular problem, but you may be actually creating another problem in, in another area. So, you know, you want to be able to have conversations with as many stakeholders as possible that have, you know, you know that will deliver in terms of uh, addressing the questions you're trying to answer. Um, but again, um, for us, it is important to always have, you know, people at the forefront who are, you know, understanding. Because part of, part of the organizing that we try to do is not transactional. It's, it's, it's rather transformational. Uh, we want people to understand, you know, uh, you know, who they are as workers, but also their relationship to other peoples around them, and how even you know issues around economic justice relate to you know uh, other uh, uh, areas of. Uh, you know, of, of themselves, of the community, you know, how does that relate to public education? How good is it that your kids have, you know, a really public, good public education or a good education in general, but, you know, you still struggle uh, to, make ends meet, to make ends meet or to try to, you know, at some point in the future to send your kids to uh, secondary, uh, uh, you know, higher education. So. I think understanding the context, um, you know, making sure you have conversations with as many stakeholders as possible that actually can make decisions about the issues, the issues and the questions you're trying to address, is extremely important. Thank you both so much. I think, you know, of course, with county health rankings and roadmaps and the works of, of you and many people maybe on the call, that interrelatedness in terms of looking at health from really a broad perspective and how critical that is uh, to create change. I think we have time just for one more question. And I uh, again, I think you've addressed this, but it might be helpful for people to hear a bit of a summary of how, what are some of the uh, techniques that you use or strategies you use in terms of connecting with stakeholders and in particular community individuals who, who, do ha who are most impacted and maybe have uh, uh, the least voice so often. Can you talk a little bit about that, please? I'm going to chime in. I think Natalia is having technical difficulties. Uh, she's checking her headset right now. Um, I mean, w one of the, you know, in my experience, um, while doing immigrant rights work or uh, workers' rights work, what I often find is that people don't have, you know, more often than not, people don't have an idea of uh, the scope of the problems they're facing, you know. Um, because it, it's for some, especially for immigrant communities, if you're newly arrived, you know, what you see is what you think it's, it's right, um, but it's not necessarily the case. Um, and, you know, one, one of the things that when we do workers' rights presentation, what we always ask our participants, our members, is to ask each other questions, you know, like that, you know, to begin to develop, you know, a relationship with one another, to begin understanding, you know, the nature of the situation they're in, uh, to begin to understand how is it that you go about asking the right questions. Sometimes you don't even know what are the questions you need to ask. Um, and, then, and then through that process, you know, you learn you know, certain skills, you know, you learn how to do one-on-ones, you learn how to do public speaking, you even learn to do research at a very basic uh, 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 level. Um, and then over the course of time, you know, people really, this, this, this little switch that, that turns on and the people uh, become hungry for information and hungry for, um, you know, engaging in, 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 in um, strategy, engaging in, in, in um, conversations, engaging with other people who, um, you know, they really, really uh, uh, want to, you know, connect with. 
Um, and it, it, again, you know, going back to some of the things that Natalia was talking about, it's a dynamic process. A process. Uh, it takes time. You know, for, you know, sometimes it's frustrating. You think you've taken three steps forward, but it really you're only uh, move, you know, inches, right? But you know, at the end, um, you know, it's, it's, it's the quality what matters and what people learn through the process. So, you know, those those are some of the things that have worked for me. Um, and again, I stress and invite, you know, audience, uh, uh, the, the participants in this webinar to take a look at, you know, what popular education methodology is. Because it's basically, uh, you know, you know, turning, uh, you know, uh, building knowledge uh, collectively and um, you know, using your your uh, experience uh, as someone that came from another country as somebody who, who may be different uh, you know, who may speak a, a different language who might have even different values um, you know to build with each other thank you so much Edwin there were just so many fabulous points that you made there and I think it again applies to organizing, it applies to the work that people are doing with communities and your whole point about uh, asking questions and learning from the questions and the idea of how that can really turn the switch on to where people then are hungry to be engaged when they know and better understand the issues from each other and your 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 discussion basically throughout about empowering people um, to to help them understand why they need to be engaged and how it impacts their lives is just just fabulous I'm going to now turn it back to Jan Thank you, Mary, and thank you, Edwin and uh, Natalia. I hope, Natalia, um, you can get the headset working again because we are going to come back at the uh, in a few minutes here. And uh, those of you that want to stay on for more Q&A with Edwin and Natalia, um, you'll have a, an opportunity to do that. So we'll just uh, close this out a little bit. Uh, we want to let you know that thanks to the support of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we do have 11 community coaches and we're based in Madison, Wisconsin and also regionally around the country and our assistance is available at no cost to you thanks to RWJF. And, um, so feel free to contact us through the orange boxes you see located throughout the Action Center. Um, you can just uh, connect with us and we'll get to you right away and don't hesitate if uh, you need assistance with a tool, a question, uh, connecting with another community, uh, or figuring out the next step in your process. That's what that um, Get Help button is for. And, of course, we uh, invite you to use social media to stay in touch with us and communicate about the County Health Rankings and Roadmaps program. Uh, we're on Twitter, Facebook, and, of course, we have our e-newsletter. And uh, Mary is going to uh, chat out uh, how to sign up for our e-newsletter letter and um, you can like us on Facebook and register for upcoming webinars and find recordings. Um, at, uh, and she'll send the link to you right now. And this program is a result of the contributions of many partners, including those listed here. So we want to acknowledge all of these great folks uh, on our team. At the beginning of the webinar, we introduced this guiding question, how can we support communities in mobilizing for changes that will improve health for all? And we hope that this discussion has generated some new ideas and sparked some thoughts about what you can do to empower community members and work with community partners in your community to make changes that will result in better health for, for all. So thank you very much. This is the formal part of the webinar, and uh, we will stay on for uh, 15 more minutes and see if there are some other questions that you all would like answered if you'd like to stay on. Um, looks like we have a couple people staying on. Natalia, um, Edwin, let me just check in. Is Natalia, yep, she's unmuted. That's great. Hi. There yep. you are. Yes. <laughs> Yay. Hi. Okay. I'm going to continue recording, and uh, so we can record this uh, the Q&A here, and why don't I let Mary uh, pose the next uh, question, if you're ready, Mary? 
I'm ready. All right, so, and I'm ready and I'm off mute. That really helps, right? Um, uh, another question I, that came up is co uh, coalitions often form to address a single issue like hepatitis B, um, and how can broadening the scope like immigration rights help or hinder coalitions? And I know you talked earlier so much about kind of how important that interrelatedness was, but I think it is interesting from a uh, organizing standpoint, where is the point that that has benefit in terms of focusing on one issue or several issues? Where does it help and where does it hinder? I think it helps in that, again, you know, um, as I mentioned earlier, we're not one issue people, right? So if you are organizing around um, hepatitis, um, a lot of patients um, may be dealing with other issues, right, that directly impact the way um, they can access medication, such as immigration status, um, you know, housing access, income, etc. And I think those are issues that they're not separate, right, they're inherently actually a part of what we're talking about already. Um, and I think, if anything, it helps to elevate it, t it helps to elevate your issue to kind of include all of these different stories and, and um, different folks with different backgrounds. In, in addition to what Natalia is, can you hear me? Yes. In addition to what Natalia is, is talking about, I think for us what's been important is that we lay everything on the table and that we're clear about what are the things that we're able to do because, you know, when it comes to organizing, you know, there's 20,000 projects that, you know, we may may want to get involved in. And unfortunately, as organizers, we we have never learned how to say no, right? We all want to uh, save the world. Um, but there are things that, you know, require immediate attention. They require a strategy to uh, um, to address them. So for us, what's, what's, what's been helpful is that we lay it all out on the table and talk about, for instance, uh, you know what's going on with the rate of uh, um, you know rate of homelessness in in our city. Uh, how do, how is that related to the conversation about the rights of immigrants who live in the city, who may, may be fearful of immigration policies that uh, may separate their families? Um, again, we go back to what we value as a community. Again, well, we we go back to you know the triangle of values, and we say, well, what's winnable? What's doable now? Right, because one of the other important uh, aspects of our work is having a, a timeline, having you know a sense of how long you're going to work on a particular issue. Because you can't be working on on things uh, you know uh, infinitely. Uh, you, yes, some things take years to resolve. Uh, some others take you know uh, uh, fortunately less less than many years. But I think when you are clear of what's you know laid out on the table, and you're clear about the agenda, and you make the case to connect you know one thing with the other, um, you know we realize you know the how important how how, how important and 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 how soon you know uh, it is to address you know what may even be a crisis. I mean, actually we did. Uh, find a little bit of that through through our work that we had seen an increase of uh, um, uh, homelessness in, in in our city and along with the, with, with the conversations about well are we going to be able to have jobs in the city it was important you know to also convey to a group of uh, uh, healthcare providers through each of the every community health partnership to support them for us to support their work. At the same time that we were saying to them, hey, you need to support our push to have, you know, good jobs in the city of Everett. You know, not, not only to support it, but also for us to understand, you know, what that meant and what it looked like and who who were the, the people that were being affected by it. I also, just to add one more thing, think that, um, to touch back on what I was saying about building these relationships and building trust, um, on a very basic level for me, it always comes down to the reason I make space for 
all of these different issues to intersect is because I want people to be able, when, when we're building a movement, we really want to aim for a movement where folks can bring their full selves and they don't feel like they have to hide a part of themselves um, or kind of suppress that um, because they already so often have to do that out in the world, right? And so when we're building these, these tables and these spaces, um, I really, really, and that's part of the reason that I stress that is that intersectionality and the overlap between the issues being so important is because a strong movement is one where its members and the people can bring their full selves. Um, so I just wanted to reiterate that. Thank you both. Um, there's another question uh, that's come in and it has to do with defining the stakeholders in a community. Um, are they business owners, elected officials? Who are stakeholders in a community? I mean, for us, for us, um, it's been very clear that uh, we're talking about the people who are affected, for instance, you know, by the construction of the casino in the city. And the people that have made decisions around placing the casino there. Um, you know, I, I talked a little bit about, you know, the Gaming Commission, you know, the entity that the legislature in Massachusetts created to wrestle with the idea of what do we do with, you know, with gaming in our state and gambling and all that. Um, to, you know, our elected officials at the city level, our mayor, the city council, um, and the casino developer himself, um, and and of course you know the residents you know some of whom wanted the project to to uh, to you know to happen, some of whom had a lot of questions and reservations about the project. Um, you know, people who have decision-making power uh, about you know this issue, but in general about you know, uh, things that we want to address that we have, that we, that we have questions about. You know, my, um, this is Jan again, my takeaway on your answer, and let me just check this, is um, it really has to do with what is, what is the um, target, or what's the strategy, what's, what's the win that needs to happen, what's the change that needs to happen, that drives who the stakeholders are, and the, the stakeholders are always the people most affected by, um, whatever is affecting their health, you know, in the broadest sense. And it's also whoever's been involved in um, wherever the status quo is right now. Uh, rather than just gathering a lot of people together and having a meeting, it's really on a focus campaign um, when we're talking about community organizing and getting making action happen. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I think that's really helpful. We we talk about in our action cycle the all the different sectors that need to be involved in all, order to work on the broad definition of health. And what we're talking about is taking it one step further into here is we're really moving into the act part of the cycle. What is the strategy that you want to um, most work on um, based on the health needs? And then you really select stakeholders. Um, Mary's got another question here. Yeah, this question, again, uh, somewhat goes back to messaging and communication. And you've talked about knocking on doors and um, uh, really going to stakeholders to talk with them and to build um, the relationship among people. Um, can you talk about what what methods of communication that you use are in terms of social media or be, in addition to in-person communication, what other methods have you found uh, effective? Sure, um, I can answer that. So we are, organizationally we have a Facebook account um, and we have Twitter. Um, we also use an, a, a listserv for our emails. We use all of those, which are great. And I think um, in the past year we've been exploring what the most effective way to use those is. Um, we would find that Facebook got us, um, you know, kind of at actions, right? So if we made an event for an action, we would get um, the same kind of activists that were active on Facebook at, at actions. So in the past year, we've really been exploring at Jobs of Justice what it means um, to communicate. And I think sometimes folks think of communications as separate 
a piece of this when actually um, we as an organization have really come to the understanding that communications is organizing and organizing is communications. Um, we are again talking to folks and, and building um, building relationships and so for us that's really what's important. Yes we have talking points and we come up with those as a group but we really are trying to focus, we still use our social media, but we're really trying to focus more on those face-to-face -face relationships. But to answer the question, we do have a Facebook and a Twitter, and we do use them pretty actively, and we also send out um, email updates a couple of times a week. If, if I could chime in, um, you know, over the, over the course of many years, what I have learned in particular is, is again, um, understanding you know the people that we are the, that we are organizing with, and in my case, because my background, my primary primary background is immigrant workers rights organizing, I've learned that you know people have very peculiar sources of information. You know, we yes now with technology and and, and a lot of the modern uh, ways of communicating, we use social media a lot. We use you know emails stuff but people still rely particularly in, in newly arrived communities and, and immigrant communities and ethnic communities you they have you know their own community newspapers their weeklies their uh, they have a lot of our uh, in particular the Latin American communities are very, is heavily Catholic so they hear a lot of the information you know from their leaders at their churches and congregations on Sundays. They have, they listen to radio uh, uh, programs that cater to specifically to even their own nationalities. Uh, you know, in Boston there is a, there's, there's, there's a, there's a variety of Central American uh, uh, Spanish-speaking radio programs that people rely on as a source of information. Um, so, you know, it is important, as, as much as it is important to use modern technology because, you know, I would tell you my son would not listen you know, to a radio station in Spanish uh, right now. He'd rather, uh, you know, look at what's on, on, on the Internet or, or computers, right? Uh, but at the same time that we do that, you know, it's important to always uh, take a look at what, you know, the folks that we organize and we use as a resource for for information, whether it's you know different platforms, ethnic media, uh, their their sort of uh, respected leadership, um, um, and 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 community radio. Uh, thank. You. Those were just great points, and and again, just highlighting building relationships and really understanding the community you work with. And as I think there are many people on the call, as there uh, who are from rural areas, I <clears throat> excuse me. I think that what you're saying really applies in terms of uh, also in rural areas. Looking at how do people how do people get the word out. How do people find out information? Is it through the church? Is it, like you said, through the newsletter? Um, and just really understanding what are those informal and formal leaderships within uh, in the community and how do they communicate their message and, and maximizing that. I'm going to now uh, turn it back to Jan and um, I just want to uh, first thank you so much. I feel this has been so enriching and will be so helpful to all our participants, both who were able to be on today and those who uh, will listen to the recording. So Jan. Thank you so much, Edwin and Natalia. You two are just fabulous webinar guests and, and have worked very hard with us to um, make this a webinar that we hope is really going to be useful to people for a long time to come. It will be archived on our site along with the handouts. And um, we just are, are so delighted to have worked with you all. And thank you for taking us deeper into community organizing. I feel I've learned so much about it. Um, just in this brief amount of time with you all. So again, thank you so very much. 
And, and I, thank you for the invitation. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I am going. Yeah. Any any last comments that you all want to make? We invite you to to check out our our web page. Um, you know, there there's both the National Jobs for Justice website that you know talks to you about our, our national network. We're in about 24 cities across the country, uh, but also our page in Massachusetts. You know, that gives you an illustration of you know of what other areas you know that we work on. Um, and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, this 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 was something enlightening and that you learn something from it and, and you know feel free to you know get in touch with us. Thank you so very much. You're very gracious. All right, I'm going to end the webinar now and um, thank you again.